Okay, I think we should start. Uh, so good evening uh, to everyone here in Israel and good morning and afternoon uh, or whatever to all those of you elsewhere. I'm um, very glad you joined us from all over the world. Uh, I'm very glad that um, uh, to open or to have you all with us on the fifth and final conversation in the series Art, uh, Culture and Society in the Post-Coronavirus Age. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity and, and thank all of the participants in the previous uh, conversation that we had, all the professors and, and faculty members from Tel Aviv University who hosted beautifully and very intelligently uh, those uh, conversations. So I see some of you joining us uh, now. So thank you all for, for the good work. Um, and I'd like to start with a special welcome and greetings to our distinguished guest this evening, Professor Joel Sanders of Yale University. Before I introduce him properly, uh, I'd like to um, say a few words. Um, this series started a month and a half ago as part of our attempt to develop a deeper understanding of the conditions imposed on us by the current pandemic and the accompanying social and economic crises. When we started the series, on June 10th, actually, we here, here in Israel, we're just emerging uh, from the so-called first wave of the coronavirus, hence the word post in the series title, post-coronavirus age. At that moment, Israel has just been released from two months of total lockdown, which was not easy. And uh, there was a widespread belief that uh, the pandemic was behind us. This, of course, turned out to be a rather naive fantasy, as we all experience now. Today, as the number of uh, infected people here and other, in other countries uh, around the world continues to skyrocket and there is no end in sight, we are reluctantly beginning to accept that the virus is here to, virus is here to stay, at least for the time being. This leaves us with little choice but to adjust our lives in ways both large and small to the new reality. Thus, the series, talks, the series of talks was meant to shed light on how we should relate to the pandemic by presenting dif different artistic perspectives from the fields of performance and museums, cinema and digital media, theater, and the fine arts. The goal was to examine these uh, issues both theoretically and practically. But we're not there yet. I'm certain that the future will see critical takes of cinematic and theatrical representation of the pandemic and its outcomes. But for me, the more interesting question is to see how the pandemic is going to shift our modes of expression. Will theater remain as it, as it, as it is today? Will the consumption of films uh, be the same? And what about music and art and architecture? And the list goes on and on. Today, we are going to talk with one of the highly innovative architects who have started to speculate about the ways in which architecture and space will be transformed as a result of the pandemic. Joel Sanders, together with a group of students from Yale University and his research, research practice, Mixed Design, took the challenge and came up with design ideas that, rep that respond to the pandemic. And I'm certain that we'll hear You'll hear about, about it uh, uh, shortly. Your work, Joel's work is particularly interesting because of the parallels that he draws between the uh, social impact of COVID-19 as it struck already weak communities disproportionately hard and the growing activism of minorities that have been subject to systematic discrimination for many years before the pandemic. In other words, the pandemic is not only a health issue, but also has sweeping social consequences, which are no less important. In his work, Joel capitalizes on, the, on his experience in dealing with disadvantaged, disadvantaged minorities to understand current so social condition, conditions and how we should relate to them. The linkage between the health crisis and the social one is not only practical, but also absolutely crucial. So before I, before I, uh, we let uh, Joel start uh, and elaborate on that, let me introduce him. 
Joel Sanders is uh, the founder of Mixed Design, an inclusive design think tank and a consultancy that is branch of his New York-based LGBTBE certified architecture design, Joel Sanders Architecture. Mixed Design is, dedica is dedicated to making everyday building types like restroom, art museums, and university campuses accessible and welcoming to people of different age, gender, abilities, cultural identities, and religions. Mixed Design initiatives include STOLD, an, an American Institute of Architects award-winning project that responds to national contro controversies surrounding transgender access to public restrooms. In addition for, uh, to being a uh, principal of Joel Sanders Architect Mixed Design, um, Sanders is professor at TL University of Architect, uh, TL, uh, School, TL School of Architecture, where he directs the Master of Architecture MR2 program. Joel, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. And um, it's uh, an honor to be invited to participate. Uh, uh, if only circumstances were different, I, I'd like, I wish I could be there face to face and visiting for a second time Tel Aviv, which is one of my favorite places. Uh, and I have family in Israel. Okay, but uh, let's get started. So I guess first is, let me share the screen. Okay. Let me see. Uh, so you need to put it to PowerPoint. I, I did that already, no? It's not on PowerPoint? Uh, no, it's on your Word document. Right, okay. Uh, I'm going to stop share. Yeah. Share so screen. You need to pick the yeah. PowerPoint window. That yeah. is the PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. perfect. And now I need to just go view, presenter view. Good. Are we yeah. good? Uh, we see your notes, so go into the swap display thing. Okay, and where's that? Swap display. We good? Perfect. Yep, we're good. Okay, good, good. Uh, so now let me just shift this. Sorry for this. Now it's not going forward. How come? Okay, no, good. All right. So. Um, before I uh, sort of talk about um, uh, the topic of this conversation, I just want to begin by sharing with you a little bit about the organization of my design studio, JSM Mixed Design. We're composed of two overlapping branches. On the left side of the diagram is our architectural studio, JSA, and we specialize in doing work at universities, um, as well as art museums, um, and also to pay the bills, we also uh, do residential work, houses, urban lofts, and multifamily housing. Uh, but in 2017, I established a new branch of JSA Mixed Design. And as Aaron already said, it's a think tank and design consultancy uh, dedicated to considering the needs of a broad segment of the population that has uh, traditionally been overlooked. Uh, but, what, but what I've come to refer to, or we refer to, as non-compliant bodies, i.e. people of different ages, genders, races, and abilities that fall out of the cultural mainstream. So uh, to define the problem in a nutshell, we would argue that since the 19th century, architects and designers from Vitruvius to Le Corbusier have designed buildings based on dimensions gathered from studying and measuring the characteristics of the so-called normal body, one that, one that is assumed to be white, able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual, and male. And this ergonomic data has been the basis of design standards encoded in the architectural guidelines and regulatory codes that are still in use today. However, this purportedly scientific data has been used to differentiate normal from abnormal bodies at different moments in history, including our own, and here I'm speaking, and I should preface this, you know, all of my remarks are filtered through the lens of my work uh, as, you know, and practice in America. Uh, but I hope it uh, is relevant to uh, global concerns, including yours and, 
in Israel. So in any way, so at different moments in history, this data has been used to justify discriminatory policies determining who has access to and who is excluded from public space. And this includes women, people of color, immigrants, and the disabled, but all based on the assumption that these non-compliant bodies possess innate, either physical, mental, or moral defects that render them unfit to enter and participate in the public realm. So Meg's design is dedicated to combating this legacy of exclusion in architecture. And we work with progressive clients to apply our unique inclusive design approach to develop toolkits, guidelines, and prototypes for making everyday building types uh, safe and accessible for a wide spectrum of people with different cultural and embodied identities. And our work is based on a series of design principles which build on but differentiate themselves from the foundation, at least laid in America, by two approaches which are important. One is accessible or ADA design and the second is universal uh, design. So first, rather than focus on people with disabilities alone, we employ um, uh, an intersectional perspective based on the conviction that human experience and embodied identities are constituted by a, a variety of interconnected factors that include age, gender, race, culture, religion, and ability. And second, uh, we offer uh, an alternative to in the States what we sometimes refer to as a separate but equal model that prescribes physical accommodations like ramps and, and uh, 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 special entrances, which perhaps unintentionally, but nevertheless segregate and stigmatize those with special needs. So what we are trying to do is, to, is develop, a, develop recommendations for sharing, uh, recommendations that allow the maximum number of differently embodied and identified people individuals, friends, families, and caregivers to mix in the public space that shape our daily lives. And I want to say this, that we recognize that there are many ways of being different that don't allow for one-size-fits-all solutions. Hence, we don't use the word universal design, right? We recognize that some people and communities have unique needs that require unique solutions. So again, we're trying to find a balance between shared inclusive spaces and spaces that accommodate difference. And third, um, another important idea for us is, uh, is, is looking at these issues from a cultural and historical perspective. Rather than focus on functional solutions shaped by the seemingly objective criteria that are transmitted through building codes and standards, Mix believes that we need to take into account a per that a person's experience of the built environment is determined by quantitative as well as qualitative factors that are shaped by complex cultural, social, economic, and political forces. And for this reason, for each project, we assemble cross-disciplinary teams of experts, both from our in-house staff, board of advisors, network of consultants, that represent a uh, different uh, uh, different um, di disciplines. And finally, engagement. Inclusive design, we believe, depends on the active participa participa participation, pr participation of stakeholders and users who contribute to the design process by providing their valuable insights based on their lived experience of the designed environment. And to get there, and this is something that really we're working on very much right now. Developing engagement practices, surveys, interviews, workshops, focus groups, and tours that will help us and help our clients yield meaningful feedback that can then be used to generate innovative design solutions that empower users. So uh, th this talk is going to be divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about our sort of pre-COVID work and in particular project stalled. And then in the second half, I'm going to just show you how very recently we are trying to expand our mission and our purview to consider the impl implications of, of, of COVID-19. So 
first. Some of these design principles, we hope, um, you tell me, are we're trying to put into practice through one of our designed initiatives. It's called Stalled. Uh, we've been working on it since 2016. It's ongoing. It's a design research project that took as its point, or that takes as its point of departure, U.S. controversies about transgender access to public restrooms as a point of departure to, to address the architectural consequences of the, an important social justice issue, which is to create what we think are inclusive restrooms, not only for the trans community, but for, for everyone. And we noticed in our research that in America, many institutions were kind of trying to figure this out on their own, there, there was a kind of redundancy. And we thought what was needed was a consistent set of guidelines, recommendations that could be adopted across institutions and municipalities. And so getting back to that idea of cross-disciplinarity, the team began, it's greatly expanded, but we began with this nucleus. It consists of myself, transgender historian and scholar, Susan Stryker, Terry Kogan, um, uh, 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 a, dis uh, a legal scholar at the University of Utah, and Hugh, Hugh Mel Arroyo, who is um, uh, himself a wheelchair user and was formerly um, a policy analyst and a, an accessibility coordinator for the New York City Department of Transportation. And we think uh, that Stold distinguishes itself from the considerable bod body of work generated at least in America and was spread in the media in, in at least two ways. First, almost every account that I was reading, that we read, never covered this issue from an architectural perspective, right? In contrast, we regard public restrooms as a social justice and public health issue that could be solved through innovative architectural solutions that don't take the norm of binary sex segregated restrooms as an inevitability. And second, again, rather than consider this as a technical issue alone or something related to ergonomics, we take that broader view and look at the cultural, political, and historical dimensions of this complicated problem. So first, before coming up with design solutions, we looked at this issue from a cultural and historical perspective, a political context. We quickly realized that re re uh, restroom controversies are not new. At different moments in American history, the public restroom was a crucible that has registered social anxieties about the threat of a series of marginalized groups of entering into society. Historical milestones include debates sparked by the introduction of the separate ladies room that appeared in uh, the 1880s to, accom to accommodate women entering the, wor the workplace. Um, then uh, later, the fight to abolish what was referred to as the colored restroom during the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. And later the fear of contamination posed by gay men sharing public laboratories with straight men during the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. Uh, and finally, the pressures exerted by the disability rights movement in the US, a coalition formed by grassroots activists that led to the passing of the American with Disabilities Act in 1990, which is having an anniversary that's being celebrated in the States this year. In each instance, the public restroom, by virtue of it being a physical space, transformed an abstract concern into a tangible peril and became the setting for nightmarish fantasies of so-called normal people being compelled to physically interact with others whose mere presence in that space was considered an affront, an abomination, or a health risk. So since 2013, that there have been a series of attempts uh, in, at, uh, on the, at, at the federal and state levels in the US to deny trans people access to the bathroom assigned to the, to the gender with which they ultimately identify. And it culminated with the Trump administration undoing Obama-led legislation that protected and guaranteed LBGTQ access to public buildings. However, a victory was won just recently, a few days ago, uh, when, when the Supreme Court ruled that trans as well as the LBGTQ 
community are protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In addition to looking at restrooms through the lens of American politics, we mind and we turned our attention to also to another discipline, architectural history. Uh, and as a way, as an exercise that enabled us to challenge ingrained preconceptions that the physical space of the sex segregated restroom is a historical inevitability. And so we learned, and I don't have time to elaborate, it's a whole lecture, okay? But history teaches us that from antiquity, the Middle Ages into the, until the late 18th century, men and women, okay, bathed and eliminated together in communal bathhouses and latrines, even until even in London Bridge had holes and, it were, it, and, and going to the shitting was a social activity, okay, uh, that, that happened uh, in, in a communal and, and co-ed way. Uh, we learned that it wasn't until the advent of water delivery systems in the late 19th century that the sex segregated restroom was born and that it combined in now one space, three activities, washing, grooming, and eliminating, that has become the norm, okay? So learning that the sex segregated restroom is not a timeless inevitability based on the universal standards of privacy between the sexes. It's that argument that was the basis of Supreme Court uh, violations of transgender rights, okay? The universe, this idea that privacy between two sexes, men and women, is inevitable, is the basis of all of this, these spatial consequences. But realizing that this was historically relative and culturally contingent freed us to look at alternative design solutions, which I'll share with you. So over the past four years, Stalt has developed guidelines and prototypes that, uh, that try to go further that what in America is considered the accepted code compliance solution for all gender restrooms. And that is the single user restroom that supplements traditional sex segregated facilities with a single occupancy room, often with wheelchair access and with signage designated as gender neutral. Look, this is a step in the right direction. However, we believe it stigmatizes non-normative bodies, not only trans people, not only non-binary people, but also disabled people, isolating in them in one room that prevents them from mixing with others in public space. Instead, we favor the multi-user facility. Um, and this is a, a prototype. We work with Gallaudet University, a school for the deaf in Washington, DC to develop this prototype. And it's a multi-user solution that treats the restroom as a single open space with uh, floor to ceiling partitions and communal areas for washing and grooming. So let me just show you this brief uh, animation that shows you how it works. So what we do is we um, eliminate uh, the corridor wall that sort of segregates uh, the binary restroom. Then we eliminate the corridor wall, treating the restroom as a porous uh, extension of public space. Then we add privacy stalls of different sizes, as well as caregiving rooms, okay? Fully enclosed stalls with three fixtures, communal washing uh, fixtures. Uh, and then we have added real estate. So we, we have more room to transform the boring corridor into a lounge. In this case, what would be a kind of a lounge uh, for the uh, phys ed department, okay? And our feeling is that this is safer. There are more eyes to monitor. It no longer asks people to decide between two uh, categories that don't conform to their, their identity, male and female, and we hope it creates more lively and active space for everyone. Um, and at Gallaudet, uh, we've also developed uh, prototypes for changing rooms uh, uh, that also are inclusive and they include uh, seating for the elderly, baby changing tables, dry counters for medical procedures, and even showers equipped for Muslims to perform bathroom evolutions. Um, and Stold has also developed a prototype for high traffic spaces like airports and working with uh, uh, with uh, the extended footprint of a typical back-to-back -back airport restroom, we we thinking we're, we're thinking of the restroom as an, an agora-like precinct uh, adjacent to the main concourse that's animated by three parallel activity zones dedicated respectively to grooming, washing, and eliminating. 
And all of this, this work and other work is based on mixed design. We call it, an, in it pretentiously perhaps, our two-step inclusive design methodology, okay? And so what we do is we begin with research analysis, we conduct literature reviews, we conduct participatory engagement practices to understand the correlation between different kinds of end users identified at the left of the chart, the activities they perform, in this case, restrooms, okay? And then we uh, do a kind of a comparative analysis of these over overlapping end user needs associated with each activity that allows us to generate a matrix of shared design strategies that then have impact, have spatial consequences, right? That guide how we think about materials and finishes, how we think about wayfinding, how we think about furniture, how we think about fixtures, and also how we think about kind of ephemeral qualities of, um, of, of atmosphere, acoustics, lighting, color, and texture. So very quickly, uh, here are the three stations of our airport restroom. First is grooming. It's immediately adjacent to the airport complex. We, th we have a multi-level counter at different heights uh, that faces a mirror, okay, that allows, you know, diverse people, right, uh, to groom together as their bodies and images are, are reflected in the concourse. And we also are, are, are including of curtain alcoves for breastfeeding, administering medical procedures like insulin or hormone injections, as well as accommodating what a lot of people do in restrooms we learn these days is meditation and prayer. The communal station, the next station, meets the needs of adults, children, and people in wheelchairs. How? Uh, uh, there is again a, uh, a motion activated faucets inset into this water wall that allows water to flow in an inclined splash plane at different ergonomic heights that then is collected and cleaned in a remediated planter before being recycled. And then finally, the back of the stall describes what a, the, the back of the facility has this bank of, 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 of stalls uh, uh, of, 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 di of different sizes, including privacy ones with three fixtures that accommodate the unique needs of people like we've learned uh, religious Orthodox Jews or Muslims or Muslim women. Who, or, or men who are pee shy, right? And can't pee out in public, right? In an enclosed room. So what I wanna say is we try to come up with solutions for the maximum number of people to share, but recognizing that some people need specific requirements, okay? We don't want to erase, we acknowledge difference. Okay, and this section just shows as users circulate from one station to the next, passing from the outermost grooming station to the innermost toilet wall, we want them to experience a multi-sensory gradient that takes them from public to private, from open to closed, from smooth to coarse, from dry to wet, to acoustically re reverberant to absorptive spaces uh, to meet their needs. Also over the past two years, MIX has joined forces with uh, the Yale School of Public Health uh, to work with teachers and graduate students to bring in a new component to our mission, which is public health. Uh, the fact that we're not only interested, in other words, that the design, the design of environment impacts, impacts not only social equity, but also has a tangible uh, impact on physical and mental wealth, health and well-being. And Antonia Acaba is a graduate student who's done what's called an IRB approved medical survey, okay? interviewing uh, many, many people and have come up with evidence-based um, uh, data to prove again that inequitable bathroom access does uh, impact mental health disparities uh, between gender minority and cisgender individuals. And also we've learned that even that both genders or that, that, that both communities, if you will, prefer all gender restrooms over their other counterpart. And by the way, this is some of the data, a kind of a cross comparative matrix of a whole spectrum of different users, including uh, trans men who menstruate, uh, people with uh, colostomy bags, again, trying to correlate uh, uh, bathroom solutions that could accommodate these multiple needs. And finally, we realized that, you know, architects can come up with pretty solutions, okay? but that's not enough. We have to change uh, building codes and standards. And so in America, this meant 
changing the International Plumbing Code, which is the model code governing most construction in the US. And we joined forces with the American Institute of Architects, the National Center for Transgender Equity. We were successful. And now beginning in the next version of the code, the 2021 code, the, the multi-user type that, we're, that I've been illustrating will in America be legal uh, in, in, in the States. Okay, so now just to turn to the second part of the talk uh, before we move on, um, COVID-19. Okay, so mixed design, and this is very recent, and I have to say that I'm part of me is very uh, 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 reluctant to share this work because it's so early, okay? But we thought it might be interesting. So we, we are looking at how uh, the inevitable impact that COVID is inevitably gonna have on public buildings. And looking at these spatial implications, we see as a natural extension of our mission, again, to make spaces safe and accessible for everyone, okay? And so part of what we're trying to do is say like, what not to do, okay? And so in other words, we understand why, I'm sure this is happening in Israel, but people are desperate and they're looking for short-term fixes. That's understandable, but we prefer, to, or we will, I mean, our role, we think, if there is a role for us, is to take a, a long-term view. Rather than narrowly frame the pandemic as a public health issue, again, shaped by objective functional parameters, we advocate looking at the pandemic within a wider cultural and historical context. And most importantly, that we need to take into account the needs of marginalized and vulnerable populations that are left out of the conver conversation, okay? What we must not do, okay, what we must be vigilant against is not to repeat past historical mistakes. I'm referring to America. Over the course of American history, public health fears were used to justify the oppression and spatial segregation of non-compliant bodies, belonging, as I said, to many different people, including black lives. And another example of this is Jim Crow laws, right? Uh, that were, I think, not rescinded until I think the 1960s uh, that segregated blacks from whites, not only in restrooms, but from water coolers and lunch counters. So the point is, is that public health and inclusive design are not an either or proposition. COVID-19 risks being a setback if commercial government and institutional clients decide to reallocate and, re and prioritize resources, right? to compliant bodies at the expense of marginalized populations. So what we feel is important is to get the word out that clients need to invest in post-pandemic spaces that meet the needs of all bodies, not just the ones that society deems normal, okay? And so the challenge, what we're trying to do, and this is just so recent, okay, is collaborate in particular with our team of experts that includes uh, representatives from Yale Public Health that I mentioned, as well as CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, also in Philadelphia. And we wanted, we're in the process, at the beginning of developing space planning principles that try to address one of the fundamental challenges posed by COVID. That is the need to balance individual face-to-face -face engagement in physical space, with the imperative to restrict individuals from having physical contact with others, i.e. social distancing and touching in the built environment. So it's about touch and social distancing. Touch is relatively straightforward and you know we are just really working with the research of others to put together a catalog of materials, of finishes and equipment that will allow people to have safe contact with other people and sanitary things like touch-free fixtures, uh, hand sanitizers, toilet room fixtures, antimicrobial, easy to clean wall finishes, upholstery and furniture. But more challenging is space planning for social distance. And this involves studying proxemics, right? The way architecture dictates, if you will, and regulates how people interact with one another by distributing people and bodies in space. And this dynamics of human occupation and socialization, we need to think about bodies not only at rest, right? Like in America, you know, there are those places where you stand, right? Six feet apart. That's important, but we also need to think about bodies in movement, 
okay? And we think that these are dynamic interrelated variables that are both quantitative and qualitative. So for example, we wanna complement the work of our peers, in this case, a great architectural office in the States and good friends of mine, LTL, that are working with scientists to, for, to come up with mitigation metrics that factor formulas like density, number of occupants per area, volume of the enclosed space, viral exposure time, airflow, and even as it's impacted by time of day and season. And so we wanna complement this work by coming at the same problem, but from a more qualitative perspective, considering what we call environmental stre stressors that are shaped by social and cultural codes of contact, conduct that regulate how human beings interact. So one thing that we've learned is that for people to feel safe but connected, they need public spaces designed to minimize environmental stressors that are induced by disorientation, confusing spaces that lead to unintended contacts with people or building surfaces, or overstimulation, triggered by noise, light, and crowds. And we've learned, or we are learning, that reducing environmental stressors depends on spatial awareness of what we refer to as sensory cues that make different kinds of people aware of the presence of themselves in relation to others in space and in particular in unfamiliar public spaces. Okay, and how do we know about this or think we know about this? We're learning about sensory cues that combat environmental stressors by studying again non-compliant bodies. And in this case, we're looking at three marginalized communities, people in wheelchairs, the deaf and people on the autism spectrum who who are populations that each in their own ways have for years developed novel behavioral and design strategies for addressing social distancing to fit their unique needs that we believe can be applied to the general public. So for example, a uh, mix member, Kumel Arroyo, I talked about him before, draws from his experience of wheelchair users who have, we know, require barrier-free, smooth surfaces that allow them to social distance, right? Not hit other people or the walls of architecture. Hansel Bauman, another member of our team, is author of Deaf, Deaf Space Guidelines, right? Deaf space, in a nutshell, takes place through signing, which relies on sight. To be seen is to be heard, okay? Unlike hearing, those of us hearing folks who use two sense perceptions to walk and, and talk, vision and hearing, the deaf rely on the vision to, to simultaneously see where they're going and to, to, to see not only where they're going, but also to look at their companion. So this again requires, is, requires social distancing, reducing physical barriers, allowing clear sight lines, uh, and also maintaining proper visual conditions uh, like glare-free lighting to reduce eye strain and allow for these face-to-face -face interactions while moving and while at rest. We're also working with Magna uh, Mostafa, who's a Cairo-based architect and autism expert. She's come up with art aspects guidelines. Uh, and in a nutshell, okay, she's discovered along with others that people on the spectrum are prone to overstimulation triggered by crowds, loud noises, and bright lights, right? Which makes them avoid public space entirely. But when they do come, they need a form of social distancing. So we are in the process of, co of conducting this comparative analysis of the social distancing spatial strategies used by wheelchair users, artistic and deaf communities that we think can be applied to the general public. And we're in, we're in the process of applying these lessons in a case study that does a cross comparative analysis of different kinds of public building entry sequences. For example, this is a study for a residential college commission uh, that we've just beginning at Princeton University. Okay, And it's based on what we are again calling multi-sensory wayfinding. Our argument is that we need to augment conventional signage and use color, material, lighting, and acoustics to kind of create two differentiated kinds of legible activity zones, what we're calling barrier-free circularization paths and media microclimates that again could balance social distancing and human connectivity. And let me just very briefly walk you through this scheme. Okay, so here, 
The vestibule is conceived of as a transition zone where visitors can clean at hand sanitizing stations before entering the building. And a central planter uh, creates this kind of separate entry exit uh, uh, aisle that prevents unwanted collisions. Uh, there's a transition threshold, okay, right before uh, here that demarcates the intersection where circulation paths cross. And deaf space teaches us that you have to allow not only deaf people, but all people to slow down okay, uh, and acclimate as they change directions. Next is a barrier-free circulation zone. The idea is predictability, an un a predictable un unobstructed path that guarantees uh, the movement of bodies in ways that uh, prevent uh, or reduce accidental contact with other people and surfaces. And in this case, it features a color contrasting floor with a detectable edge for cane users and a circulation path wide enough for people to safely pass in, uh, each other. Uh, people like wheelchairs need to pass as well as pairs using sign language, okay? And then it would ultimately lead up to a, 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 a reception desk with multilingual information that can speak to many different people, okay? As well as a multi-level transaction count, uh, uh, counter. Okay, and right in back, what we're arguing in this case, right in back, you know, that, that the restroom, okay, not hidden down a corridor, okay, it's the first thing that you see immediately behind reception, okay, and this we're, we're arguing is an expanded version of the stalled restroom, a porous extension of the main entrance, it includes privacy stalls, hands-free communal sinks and toilets, activated by motion center, sensors, as well as lockers and spaces for prayer, uh, 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 and um, caregiving rooms and breastfeeding. And again, this is something that I think we, as well as others are working on. How can we incorporate these ugly social distance markers that these decals that we're finding uh, uh, by kind of uh, uh, integrating uh, 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 color and, and, and markers to uh, as floor patterns or wall patterns that will allow people the choice of practicing social distancing in public space. And finally, this is a cross section taken through a parallel section of this uh, typical campus uh, residential college. It's cut, cut through the study lounge, also divided into multi-sensory layers or zones. On the left, uh, the calm zone, it features semi-enclosed nooks for solitude and small group conversations with adjustable low level lighting and a color palette that reduces unwanted stimulation for those on the autism spectrum. And it also has high backed uh, a seating with color contrast that allows people using American Sign Language to see each other uh, signing. Okay, and then the section continues uh, and features this indoor outdoor transition zone that features these media microclimates with sound absorbing oval carpets and suspended cones that absorb sound and emit intimate pools of glare free light. And that these islands, again, we think would be good for most everybody, uh, um, but in particular for people who are prone to overstimulation uh, as well as, as, as um, uh, 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 as well as the deaf. And another thing we're also uh, advocating for is multi-height mobile modular seating that can be reconfiguration to accommodate social distancing as well as different kinds of uh, deaf space and other kinds of interaction. Okay, so to conclude, uh, uh, you know, mixed design you know, is again working to kind of expand our mission it's committed ultimately to design activism based on the twin pillars of social equity and public health. Again, equal access to public space is a civil right. At the same time, evidence-based data shows us that the designed environment has direct and tangible impact on physical and mental health. And finally, looking at architecture, we would argue through the lens of non-compliant bodies promises to be a catalyst for creativity. It will allow designers working in cross-disciplinary teams to create accessible and hygienic multi-sensory public spaces that have the potential to enhance the human experience for most everyone. So thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time with that talk. Let me put my thank you very much, uh, Joel. It was very interesting and you know, I liked the ways in which you know you think and positively about architecture and you think you know uh, the immediate question that comes to mind 
I mean, there are many questions. Some of them you've answered already in your, during your talk, but, um, you know, the immediate question would be, and, and let me also, I would like to invite also some questions from the people who, are, who joined us uh, to this webinar. So you just type your question to the Q&A. You have a Q&A button down there and just type it to the Q&A section and I'll read it to out loud and then Joel will respond to these uh, questions if you have any. But um, a, I have, you know, let me start with a couple of questions. One, a, do you, and I think, you know, it's very fascinating the ways in which you believe in architecture and, or, you know, the architecture can change, can this make these kinds of change, social, social change and not only respond uh, to social conditions. Because of course, you know, when, when you work on, um, with mixed design on, on stalled and, and uh, public bathrooms and, and so forth, uh, it seems, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm asking, in other words, are we ready to go to take this step and will societies across the world will, will adapt to these ideas and, and use them or is it, it might be, you know, a little bit premature that, you know, the people are, to communities that are not living together to start to mix together. So, I, you know, I, I, I admire your belief in, in architecture to make this change, but I, I, this is one question. I'll ask that the second question then. Uh, then um, the second question, question would be, if you think that, you know, you're striving to get to a neutral environment, one that can accommodate everyone. And I wanna raise the possibility that there, that there might be some, kind, some danger in this kind of approach that will face the identity of the user, you know, mixing everybody together and, you know, not differentiating between men, women, transgender, transgender people, you know, pe disabled people. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I can see your positive means that your ways that you're trying to, to create, but um, I, there might be a little danger in this kind of approach. So this is just two questions that came to mind. And again, if any one of from the audience would like to, to ask questions, just type them in. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, but to, maybe to respond to the second question, and I'm glad you raised it because I think, I, I you know, I hope it was clear in my presentation that we are not trying to kind of uh, uh, erase or disregard human embodied difference. In fact, our whole mission is based on the acknowledgement that there are many different forms of embodiment and identity with different needs, okay, but that they can be overlapping. So what we're trying to do is in fact, argue that a democratic society builds respect for human difference by creating a kind of melting pot that lets different kinds of people to mix in public space, right? In other words, you know, it's like the rainbow flag, okay? That you, it's, you don't just, it, it's not one kind of population, it's multiple populations. And we also, as I said, realize there's not one, everyone can share. So it's both allowing the maximum number of people to mix and mingle while acknowledging and giving separate accommodations for those with difference. And another thing I, I just wanted to, to, to argue is, is this idea of using the word neutral, okay? We don't neutralize difference. It's about, risk, again, emphasizing difference, okay? And that's one of the reasons why we reject the term uh, uh, all gender or gender, well, gender neutral or all gender restrooms. Okay, uh, because it's precisely that, that we're interested in the way the innocent conventions of architecture, right, actually uh, reinforce problematic assumptions that about difference. Okay, and we're trying to counteract that and make that work for a broader spec uh, population. And finally, we're against even using the word gender, all gender. We never do that. We call inclusive restrooms. Why? Because we're trying to shift the focus away from categorizing people, right, by gender, okay, and this reductive notion of gender as a binary, male and female, and, and are trying to shift the conversation to think about a wider spectrum of the population, which leads me to the answer of your First question, which is, are people prepared to mix and mingle? Okay, I can't speak for the situation in Israel, you know, but America has, you know, up until our recent president, you know, prided ourselves on being a melting pot, the Statue of Liberty, of being a place where people 
of different identities can mix. And so I think that's part of our ethos, but we haven't always lived up to that. I think that, um, let's say, these kinds of cultural debates, like transgender access of public restrooms, but most recently, um, the urgent debates that you know you've, I'm sure you're all aware of in our country, you know, around Black Lives Matter. Uh, I think that there's been has and continues to be a, 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 a major cultural shift, at least in America. It's polarized, but I think uh, we are on our way. I think to for the for for people recognizing that that we have to engage these issues. And then engaging them means potentially thinking about them in relationship to design and to space. Yeah, again, I, you know, I like your optimism because it seems that in, in, in some parts of the world, I think also in the US, with you know, all the, uh, the social unrest that we've seen in the last couple of months, there's some processes are going backwards, you know, into differentiation between different communities and kind of uh, division and segregation but I hope, and I hope, and I, I'm, I'm totally with you, and I hope that architecture and uh, would be able to foster this kind of inclusiveness that that you are, that even you know, even by 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 the practice itself. I mean that you are doing something. That practice will foster some kind of uh, of uh, of notion that we have to be collective. And in that respect, I. I did you think about it? We, you didn't talk about the museums. You work on museums. Uh, because I was thinking if you could elaborate a little bit about uh, this approach of inclusiveness that goes beyond the, the issue of bathroom, which is a very important issue, as you showed. Right, 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 right. Well, so, so thank you for asking about the museum. Uh, so one of our initiatives is Mixed Museum. Uh, that we're also working with Yale Public Health and with Yale students, as well as Mixed Design, as well as a, a consortium of museum partners that include the Queens Museum uh, in, in the US, the Yale University Art Gallery, uh, as well as other museums uh, abroad, including the Victoria and Albert Museum. And basically in a nutshell, um, what we were looking at was again, uh, why museums? Because I was an art history major and I've been thinking and writing about museums, we've been designing museums. But, but because this is another, like, like I, I showed you art designs for university campuses, I mean another sector that we design for, but these the universities and museums are two progressive institutions that are making you know, huge strides, not only in America, but we know all over the world, to make, their, make themselves their institutions more diverse and inclusive. Our research shows is how are they doing this? Well, they're doing good things. They are trying to diversify their staff, human resources, boards. They're doing it through curatorial practices, right? At least in New York right now, almost any museum you go to for the past four or five years has had a show that represents those kinds of people of different color, disabilities, etc., cetera, uh, who are not, represented in the museum okay and we're saying that's great but again we need to go further why because we need, at least in the states and data shows this that when you look around you the vast majority of people who are going to visiting museums tend to be white uh people uh, so what we're trying to do now and it's about building awareness is work with uh, uh museum partners to say let's learn from your end user groups and come up with spatial strategies that would make you know the spaces uh, more inclusive and welcome more and, and welcoming and by the way i showed you that university campus right and this is also a mission of princeton university we're just working with them they're building a new residential college okay they recognize that if they're going to move forward into the 21st century they have to make uh, new kinds of spaces that are you know broadly intersectional and are welcoming and to some extent countered the image in the states that schools like Yale University where I teach have that they're elitist and that they you know you know white anglophile institutions so uh, but so in any way to get there just to say why this entry sequence so what we found maybe I'm going on too long that was really interesting that we found that it, the museums that we talked to many of them had the same issue in a different form, which was, we thought the problem was gonna be in the galleries, but actually there's been a lot of work about how to make, gal how to make art 
like through labeling and so forth, more accessible. But it was the it, it was this whole getting people from the street to the sidewalk to the entry to the reception desk to lounges to bathrooms, all of those interstitial spaces. Um, that was the problem for them. And then we were talking to our colleagues at hospitals, and they said, "Well, that's our problem." Okay. And then that's and so that's where we started changing our thinking and that not only are we looking at the particularities of unique building types, we're looking across building types and that's what we're trying to do now. And this just happened right before COVID, okay? And now with COVID, we're saying, okay, let's look at these sequences through the lens of non-compliant bodies and COVID. So I hope that answers the well, question. Yeah, sure, it answers. So it's about the transition from one situation to another situation and how actually space and architecture should mediate these transitions and make them, because I think, you know, this is the issue of the, the public sphere and how we consume the public sphere and how we can, you can go from one mode of consumption of public sphere into another one. In other words, you know, the museum interiority versus its exteriority and how you tra the transition from one space to another. So, uh, and I think it's very, you know, it's very much the point in the sense how to, uh, to relate to this question and how to, to resolve uh, this transition in order to make it uh, museums accommodate for everyone. Because I guess taking the first step into the museum might be the, you know, the, the, the hardest step to take for, for many visitors. Exactly. I mean, another example of that, I don't, I don't have illustrations here, but you could visit, by the way, I would encourage people, we have a few websites. It's, one is called Mixed Design. Um, and uh, where a lot of this work is, is, is illustrated, uh, uh, including at Yale University Art Gallery. This is across the street from where I teach at Yale. It's one of the great buildings by Louis Kahn, okay? And fantastic, but designed, you know, in the 50s, you know, when that non-compliant bodies wasn't an issue. It's complete, you know, so there's a whole host of things from the, you can't, the entry is illegible. There's a staircase that, you, you know, is inaccessible. I mean, there's so many issues and problems that, you know, sort of need, need, need to be addressed so that Yale could meet its challenge, which is not only accommodating the academic community, but the citizens of New Haven, okay, which is a, a very, you know, a, a, a composed of uh, underserved poor minorities. Right. We have some questions from the, okay. let me read them to you. Uh, Eli Tomer asks, so, and I'm, like, I'm reading, so can we trust uh, that these solutions for social distancing needs or should and will be used also after COVID-19 uh, phenomena uh, that will hope, hopefully will pass? So I guess, I assume if I understand the question correctly, uh, maybe about the danger of, uh, of uh, this kind of um, solution that uh, might stay with us or you know how it will how it will affect you know the social distancing how it right. will affect the consumption of space in the future that will hopefully will return to something that we used to to know or or uh, uh, behave accordingly yeah well of course that question is the question that we're all asking we don't have crystal balls but how, is this here to stay will we go back to where we were before hopefully but I predict it's unlikely. I mean, I, not, not I, I think many. You know, I think that in the same way uh, that, it, that all over the world, but especially in America, that security uh, at public buildings, museums, government buildings, you know, even, even housing in, in America is irrevocably different. Airports, right, since 9-11. Uh, 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 Okay, it's here to stay. Okay, and I, I think that this is likely going to happen again. So I think we have to, you know, take the bull by the horns and 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 embrace that. But I hoped, you know, again, the solutions that I showed you, many of like like the designs for the the campus, we started looking at that work of that entry sequence before COVID. Okay, and. Again, what I was trying to say is that our goal to create these shared public spaces that met the needs of these three populations, right? It was almost by coincidence 
are people, as I said to you before, who happen to practice social distancing. In other words, I guess what I'm saying, social distancing, the uh, proxemics, the understanding of where we are in relationship to people in other space is what everybody needs, especially certain marginalized communities to begin to, 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 to operate in public space. And I think as a corollary, these principles are relevant, but not exclusive to COVID. So by introducing these principles now, I don't think they're going to be obsolete. That's my, that's my hope. Okay, let me read another question by our friend, the art historian, Sal Beninga. She's asking regarding mixed bathrooms, what uh, about woman, women who feel more comfortable entering a ladies room? only room. Uh, she says that she can imagine that a threatening aspect in gender mixed bathrooms late at night, for instance, in addition to that it could also create a safe space for sexual predators. So how do you relate to... Okay, well, thanks for that question. And it's a question that I would say comes up at, almost, at every discussion like this that we have, okay? And it's an important one. And I, I think the answer is a couple. One is about safety. Okay, and one of the statistics show, okay, that the more isolated and alone one is in a, in other words, a predator is not stop, it is not prevented from entering into a woman's or, or a men's room statistics show. Okay, but the question is, some people would argue is having more eyes to monitor the street. The more people who are present and there, right? The Jane Jacobs idea, right? Uh, 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 the safer it can be. So to, to us, it's maximum occupancy of, of many different people and the ability to shout and scream, okay, and, and, and make people aware that, that you're there, that you could be in danger. But I think another issue that comes up often that is implied or not implied or maybe stated in uh, this person's question is this the idea that historically restrooms have been safe spaces for women, right? Uh, uh, places for them to congregate, right? To, to, to spaces, um, uh, to share, to be outside of the, the, the surveillance gaze of patriarchy, okay? And we hear that. Another thing we also often hear is that men are dirtier than women and, and women won't want to share spaces with them. And again, I don't have time, but this is the kind of research that in particular that Yale Public Health is doing. And a lot of evidence-based research shows that cleanliness between the sexes, it's not so clear cut. Okay, uh, 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 between the two of them, a lot of them is about expectations and codes of conduct. After all, we share spaces between uh, sexes and identities at home. Um, it's about respect. Uh, but also, uh, another thing that we're trying to do is that in these restrooms, we are always providing or advocating at least one, if not more, private stalls with three fixtures that allow for complete privacy and caregiving. Okay, or, 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 or caregiving or allow women and men to come together in that space and do what they need to do. Okay, uh, and you know, and the last thing, um, um, you know, I would say too is that, that I think it's also about establishing priorities. And um, well, this isn't a question that was asked and then I'll shut up. But, you know, my work began with stud, really. Right? You know, I was 100 years ago, 40 years ago, well, 25 years ago exactly, I published a book and I was like the, the, the you know, the, the advocate for queer space. And a lot of people said to me, you of all people are going to deny the LBGT community spaces of, of, you know, for cruising and congregation. And I would say, well, no. Okay. Um, but it's about reestablishing priorities. A lot of that kind of exchange, I think is happening over the internet or in other venues. And I think that as we move forward, we can't solve everybody's needs and we have to establish priorities. And in this case, I think the priority is to sort of accommodate not only transgender people, but a whole series of communities uh, that, that have not been underserved communities that are just gaining visibility. Okay, so let's go on with two questions that has to do with the, um, the economic uh, aspects of, uh, of your proposal, because uh, uh, our colleague Thea Kisselov, she asked if these solutions for, 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 for COVID-19 uh, and the space consumption is not only for, for the wealthy, you know, because space 
we know the space is very expensive. The square footage of is, you know, especially in New York and other places, also in Tel Aviv, is is very high. Uh, so whether these solutions, I mean, how is how won't this kind of solution create also some kind of social discrimination, or how how we could resolve this issue that the separation and social distancing won't, won't create even even greater social strata. This is one thing. And then uh, Peter Ramon asks if, and uh, let me read it, in the post-coronavirus era with tremendous economic backset, who will finance the, the suggested modification or of the new, uh, new design? So I think these are two, two questions that has to do with the uh, same side, both sides of the same question. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, there, there's no question, you know, that these solutions are going to cost money. Okay. Um, uh, I, I would say two things. In terms of, I mean, a, a, anyway, I hope I've already made clear that our agenda is, is, is to not reprior, okay, I'm going to start again. It, in terms of reinforcing class differences and economic differences, that's a huge issue, okay? Our work, what we're talking about is for public spaces, the pu public spaces of institutions, government buildings, schools and university campuses. So that's exactly the mission. These are spaces that would be occupied by everyone, right? And two, what we're trying to say and what we're already seeing to some extent is that, it, that people are reallocating resources and saying, we can't, you know, Joel, we don't have any more time, you know, for you to, to help us with your, you know, all gender restrooms, because we have to really focus on what counts or what's immediate, which is COVID-19 fixes. Okay, and we're trying to, sh to show that, 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 that the two situations are married. Now, I'm not a, an economist or, and I'm not in a position to talk about who's going to finance this, okay? And of course, I think it depends on the sector. Is it a commercial client, a private sector, Princeton University, a campus, or is it, a, or is it the federal government? So I think, in, you know, depending on who the clients are, who commission these public spaces, I think that they have to take on the responsibility of, of, of paying for them. And I don't, I don't know what, it, what it's like in Israel, but this ain't a choice, right? I mean, you know, offices can't open, right? Museums can't open, public buildings can't open. They have to already be demonstrating that they are introducing these uh, accommodations that cost money. In fact, I'm trying to open my own office and we're studying my own office and it's going to cost me a pretty penny, you know, if I want to get my staff back in there, okay, which is a whole other question, okay. Anyway, it's not a choice, okay. We're going to have to spend money to, to, to deal with this, at least in the short term. I don't know if that answers the question anyway. It answers, but I think, you know, the issue that we still have to keep in mind that even with, uh, you know, spending or investing money on, on, on spatial, um, spatial solutions for COVID-19 uh, that it's distributed evenly within yes. among, among different uh, uh, you know, sectors of, of societies. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Or maybe another way of saying that, it's not just a question of, of, of this school or this museum, it's a question in which demographic district and neighborhood and who are the populations that that building is serving and that we I think that's I think very very important that we have to make sure it's yeah. equitable yeah. Right. a few more we have a few more questions and then I think we'll let you off it's, you know you have a day ahead of you and for us it's a it's a night uh, our friend Doraya Harari has if uh, you think that there will be a new building regulations or, or codes as uh, COVID, as a result of COVID-19, uh, what are, I mean, here in Israel, people are not talking about it yet, uh, because I think we're in the midst of the pandemic and uh, we're not sure how it's going to affect. Hopefully it will, it will be gone, sure, but you know, I think we, we have to be ready uh, for new um, outbreaks of this kind of pandemics. So, and they will be incorporated into building regulations and codes. Uh, so what, what is, the discussion about it in in the in North America in the U.S. Yeah, so far as I, well, I, I, my first answer uh, uh, is that so far I haven't heard people again like Israel. I think it's premature for people to think long term about changing building codes, but already you know I, I, uh, 
uh, New York City, you know, we get, I get emails almost uh, on a weekly basis that are updating regulations from the, like the building department. Like, what does it mean to, you know, there are now very specific regulations about opening a business or in this case, like, you know, my practice, we, we have buildings that were in the uh, projects in the midst of construction that were halted. And then, you know, so there are the, the New York City, the building department, for example, has very strict regulations and inspectors that are making sure that we comply with it. So it's beginning to happen, but it will take time. But, you know, I think, you know, here is where I'm going to be extremely critical of, of you know, um, of you know, the, the present administration. OK, uh, we live in a huge country, right, with so many different states and municipalities, all who have their own regulations. It's very, very inefficient. OK, and now it's it, it, it's being this problem, I think, is being made exacerbated by, you know, our president, who is absolutely against having any kind of regulations, right, uh, 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 in, in response to this. So we're in a very, very dire place right now. Yeah, and of course, I, I mean, hope it will change. You see across the words, you know, the regimes became tighter, I mean, it's just to extend that even they, you know, they deprive uh, human rights, uh, you know, as, as a as an excuse to manage the pandemic. Uh, yeah. So, you know, within a capitalist or within capitalism, you know, the issue of not, uh, not interfering with people's life or letting the pandemic just go away or, you know, pass, pass uh, then I guess, you know, it's also, you know, it's, it's also a way to, to relate to this, uh, uh, to this uh, phenomena. But I think, it, you know, it's, in, in the countries you see in, in Scandinavia and other countries where they tried not just to let the uh, COVID-19 uh, people get infected and have uh, and get immune by themselves. You know, it didn't work eventually. And you see it also the same in the US. So there, there has to be some kind of monitoring of the, uh, yeah. of the pandemic. But you know, I think what, you re what you're saying, Aaron, is really important because I think it's finding a balance uh, between establishing rules and regulations that people abide by, but not at the, you know, not 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 at the risk of 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 um, you know denying them certain basic human rights, and we don't probably have time to talk about this. But you know, this is also I think relating to you know the way in which digital technologies, coupled with you know old old um, school surveillance devices installed in buildings, right, are you know monitoring human behavior, but it's as a as a way of really controlling, right, gathering and data gathering and controlling. Uh, subjects right and that that is the instrument of oppressive regimes by the way which i we i read this morning our president said that he wants the um um uh, uh, the, the uh, federal agency regulating health to directly have access to get this data directly to do this kind of monitoring right so so in other words i think you know what we're all talking about the same thing how do you balance changing human behavior in public space in a way that doesn't infringe on uh, human rights and, and, and individual autonomy. And the question here is, so could you elaborate a little bit about that in relation to how architecture could, could assist because you know, architecture space and in the environments where we live in it became extremely surveilled in you know in the last 20 years you i mean in tel aviv or jerusalem or elsewhere i mean you cannot move without being you know, without being inspected and being photographed so, uh, uh, so so on one hand you know i think it has some benefits you know give some 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 kind of some same sense of safety but then on the other hand uh, you're always always being monitored so and with the covid uh, how do you think this kind of uh, how space and environment could be modified or work with this within this context? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And um, I don't have a good answer for, for that. Um, what comes to mind is first that ultimately, I think that this is more of a question that has to be shouldered by, let's say, government regulations and already you know there's so many controversies about trying to kind of control and regulate these huge you know companies like google and and, and facebook right uh, uh or, or or you know retail environments that monitor like amazon in, in the united states 
that in the name of, you know, I, I think you know what I'm getting at. So I think it, that's huge. Um, however, um, I do, I have been thinking a little bit about museums. And one of the things that interests me is the eyes that watch you while you watch, while you look at, look at art. And those are the human eyes of the guards or the guards that inspect your bags when you enter. Um, and those people, by the way, are more often people of color uh, uh, or, or underserved minorities. And then, of course, the surveillance devices, the electronic surveillance devices that you don't see that are concealed. And so I don't think this is a very good answer, um, but I think that architects uh, and designers have embraced the kind of guilty conscience that we have about this kind of monitoring, which is to cleverly find ways, particularly in museums in the name of creating non-distracting environments to hide that, right? Or where does that guard stand awkwardly in a room, okay? And I, and I think that we need to find ways, I think I guess making people aware that these that this surveillance across different registers, both physical and actual, are taking place, and letting people be aware of it, and also in a certain way, it's it would it would be a, a kind of con a consensus that by entering into that public space, you were aware that this was happening, and that you were in a certain way consenting to doing so. I don't know if that's a very good answer. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess you know this is where we're at, and you know we just have to be conscious that you know that surveillance is working for us and it's not being uh, being abused by yeah. different uh, agencies let me read another question an interesting question from our friend uh, with Pinchas. she asks about um, the impact of uh, the pandemic on residential environment and housing in terms of isolation in terms of maybe you know, it might foster also gated communities. You see more and more people are, you know, because you work on inclusiveness, you know, COVID-19 might, you know, one might, might say that it created more kind of segregation. People are trying to be segregated in, in, in their homes, whether they're locked down or not. I mean, so how would the, the pandemic uh, affect um, residential environments? I mean, that, that's a huge question. And it's not something that we've been focusing on, but others have. I mean, I, I think a lot of people are trying to come up with, you know, what will the future, you know, as, as you know, if, as people predict, we might be working, you know, living and working at home, what kinds of transformations will, will, will need to take place, you know, even at the scale of the unit. But, 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 but what you're saying, I don't have an answer for, is uh, exacerbated in, in where I live in Manhattan, which is a, you know, a tale of two cities where, um, uh, for example, I live in a residential co-op, okay, and um, in the West Village in a, in a wealthy community. And, you know, I was, there was, I don't know what the percentage was, but it was basically just, you know, not that many of us uh, being taken care of by a wonderful staff, right? Of, of, of what we deemed essential workers who were for the most part, again, people of lower income brackets and all, also of minorities. And, um, and you know, I, I don't know if this is happening in Tel Aviv, but every, you know, people who have means have fled to their country houses or are renting places outside of New York. So it's, it's a huge, huge, huge problem. Well, Israel is too small, I mean, you cannot, you cannot uh, fled to, you know, to, to because you know the country is tiny, so people are, people mostly stayed in their homes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me ask maybe one last question because it's almost eight thirty here. And uh, uh, have you taken into account? This is our friend Daniel. He asks uh, if you take if if you take into account uh, if you've taken into account uh, users who suffer from all kind of phobias like claustrophobia. And underground toilet facilities without win windows and all these kind of aspects uh, when working on a stall. And, and yeah, well, well, definitely, and I'm I'm, I'm glad that people have the question that you know we've been sort of focusing more on health issues or um, uh, or gender issues, you know, in this discussion um, at restrooms. But uh, you know, 
bathrooms, almost without exception, depending on who you are, elicit all kinds of deep-seated sort of almost visceral responses that people have um, about, you know, claustrophobia or about, um, you know, coming into contact with bodily fluids, right? Many of them, quote unquote, you know, not evidence-based, but, but, you know, sort of psychological. And so this is something that, again, uh, Antonia Cava is part of her research that we are hopefully are going to be publishing soon in a, in a book. We'll, we'll sort of describe in more detail some of the needs of these populations and maybe how we could address them. But claustrophobia is really, really important. And one anecdote is so that I asked my own students at Yale in a seminar I teach to think about this. Uh, and, um, and I always say to them, you are, each of us is a non-compliant body. So we were again analyzing spaces at the Yale University Art Gallery and we said go and from your perspective identify a problem and solve it. And this was a student from uh, China who said that they were both pee shy and suffered from claustrophobia and they just felt they couldn't even use the museum for that reason unless there were spatial measures. So there's so many factors to consider. The question is we can't think of them all. Okay. Uh, in other words, we'd like to think of them all, but the question is finding a client with the time, incentive, and money that will really let you really address as many of them as you possibly can. Okay. Do you have, uh, before we conclude, do you have any, anything that you want to add or something that we, you know, we might want to emphasize on your work and maybe the relationship between uh, you work the office and the work at, at school, at uh, TL, and how the, how they infuse each other. Well, that's that's a good question. You know, for me, I've always tried to. You know, I, I began my career as a as a academic, so I've always been trying to juggle and kind of uh, work between academia and practice. And on like bad days, it's a nightmare, and I feel like I do two jobs bad you know, not, not well enough. But I think at other times, you know, it, it's it's fantastic because I, I wouldn't be doing any of this work if it weren't for the, the students. And I think that when you're a professor, I don't know if you would agree with this, Saren, that um, you're in a hot seat and you've got to put your money where your mouth is and you've got to practice what you preach and you've got to keep on changing you know, and responding. So I, I feel like, uh, you know, I don't know if I've done a good job of it, but that's what I try to do is basically, I would say it's the issues that I think are raised by dealing with young people that are, you know, that, that, that come up in academia, particularly that address urgent social issues that for me have been the catalyst that have, you know, fueled the practice. I think I completely agree with that. I mean, yeah. when you are teaching, you are the, it's a big responsibility, and you cannot uh, practice what you're not, what you're if you're not practicing what you're teaching, then you are you're in trouble. Yeah, the students, you know, they're sharp, and they will immediately see that. Yeah. yeah. So, and I also, and the students are the ones that generate the most in, innovative ideas. Yeah. Right. Many of which. You know, then I take, borrow, steal, if you will. I hope, I hope we don't say steal. Uh, you know, for example, I'll give you one thing. I hope people visit our website. And on it, there's stuff about Yale University Art Gallery. And they're all, I just, we recently just posted, you know, the student projects from my seminar and they're all credited. So I really hope that, um, that all the people that work with us, including students who are making valuable contributions are properly credited as, as con contributors and collaborators to a, to a bigger network operation. Sure. Great. Well, here at Tel Aviv University and we have uh, some, you know, many professors joined us and also the head of the School of, of Architecture will be very glad, who is also, you know, he, he got his master's degrees for Goy Kuslovsky from, from Yale University. Oh, good. Okay, he moved to Princeton, but we'll be very glad to collaborate uh, with you on, on this project or other projects. So thanks for joining us. Yeah. You know, one thing I would say, though, is that you know, one of the things we are very interested in is a kind of cross-cultural understanding of how these same ideas are iterated differently. And for example, I'm working on a team that's been postponed for the Venice Biennale, and it's called Your Bathroom is a Battleground. And we're looking at, you know, at how bathrooms have been 
are being waged around the world and on all, on all, you know, in, in the, all the different continents. And, you know, I would very much like, you know, I mean, you know, again, to know like what of these issues that I've talked about are relevant or prioritized in Israel, where are their overlaps, where are their affinities, and are there ways that we all might, you know, form alliances. And one example of that is, is Mustafa, uh, uh, Magda Mustafa, who we're, who's, we Zoom twice a week with from Cairo, not that far from you. Great, so we have to schedule our next uh, meeting then. But okay. definitely, I mean, unfortunately I cannot say, we're not that advanced as you are in terms of understanding this issue, uh, but we definitely will be glad to, you know, to provide our, our perspective and what's going on here in, in Tel Aviv and Israel at large uh, in relation to, to the issue that you bring up. Okay, and you have to promise me you'll invite me when this is all over so I can come back to Tel Aviv. And also, I think the food is just beyond, that, that was what I didn't expect was how fantastic the food is. I'm with you and that, and you have an open invitation whenever you can get here. I'm sure the School of Architecture will be glad to have you and also the Faculty of the Arts. So thanks again for joining uh, us. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks everybody for keeping up with us for the entire series, and we'll see you next in next in the next series. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.